had so much experience taking care of thousands of patients in this community, and I've seen people who were paralyzed and who people who couldn't walk and who couldn't have their balance and you know, or people who have permanent damage due to B12 deficiency. I've seen enough of this, enough damage from plant-based eating, whether that's not supplemented appropriately, to be more cautious and conservative in this, in this field. I initially paid most attention to people not taking supplements because clearly there's sufficient evidence in the scientific literature that many supplemental ingredients shorten lifespan, don't lengthen lifespan. Particularly, these are the six or so that I recommend people not take as a supplement are vitamin A, which is retinol palmitate or acetyl palmitate, beta carotene, because there are, you know, hundreds of different carotenoids, and you take one, you block the absorption of others. Vitamin E, because there's eight vitamin E fragments, and taking one has been shown to increase risk of death. We'll go through some of those, some of the data. Folic acid, probably the most dangerous supplement people could take is folic acid, increases risk of breast cancer, prostate cancer, and colon cancer. Um, we'll go into some of the reasons why. And the reason why it's the most dangerous supplement is because it's the one people take the most extra of that they don't need, and because people not eating vegetables are told to take folic acid, which doesn't take the place of what you would get from vegetables. It enables people to, take, to think they're okay not having a high folate in their blood when they need a high folate in their blood. Copper, iron, things that are pro-oxidants that you don't need. But iron supplementation is variable based on individuals because some people, especially women, or a woman could be losing iron when they're bleeding through their menstrual periods, but some women also, even postmenopausally, don't absorb iron well. So we're saying with iron that people shouldn't take iron unless they need it. If your ferritin level is adequate, you shouldn't be taking iron. And that goes for pregnancy too. The problem with um, the one-size-fits-all approach is that you know obstetricians and people re and the health authorities recommend that pregnant women take a multivitamin that includes folic acid and iron. And first of all, they shouldn't be taking folic acid because they should be eating real food that has folate in it, like green vegetables and beans and produce to get their folate, because folate is not folic acid. And plus they're getting other nutrients that protects the child from allergies and infections and autoimmune diseases and cancer when they eat green vegetables. The recommendation of iron during pregnancy should not be an across-the-board recommendation either because some women absorb iron well and if their iron level stores are normal and you give them iron, even when they're pregnant, it increases risk to the baby. It's only helpful to take iron when there's a need for iron, not when you already have excess iron or adequate iron. And the blood test that determines whether you need iron or not is called ferritin. It's the blood test that registers your iron stores. The iron level is not as accurate as, your, as the ferritin level. So it's easy enough to check your hemoglobin, hematocrit, ferritin, um, iron binding proteins, and all those things, but you really just need a ferritin. And if your ferritin is below 50 and you're pregnant, you should be taking iron. If you're around 50, maybe you don't, don't need iron, but certainly if you're below 50, you should be taking iron. Now you only absorb a little bit of iron from an iron supplement. The body can only absorb a little bit at a time. So if a person is very deficient in iron, they've had blood loss, they're bleeding a lot, they don't absorb iron well, their ferritin is 10 or 20 or lo very low, then it's better they don't take a high-dose iron supplement because it can constipate them or upset their digestive tract. It's better to take a low dose but take it more frequently. Like take it with each meal so until you get your iron stores up. It takes usually a few months to bring the iron stores up to normal. So I'm not saying that nobody should be taking a supplement with iron in it, but some people should, but it's something you should not be taking unless you need it. Just to review some of the information on folic acid supplements, here's a 10-year study of women, just 10 years, I mean, we're following cancer risk from a supplement, maybe we should go out 20 or 30 years or 40 years to see real true risk, because the lag time from the incurrence of causation to actual cancer occurrence could be 30 or 40 years, but even in a 10-year study, it increased breast cancer risk by tw over 20%. And then a six-year study in Norway should increase risk of death by cancer by 43%, but I think in that study, they were tracking back to people who were using folic acid before the study began. Food-derived folate is powerfully protective against neural tube defects, birth defects, childhood cancers, and, oh, and when you take food-derived folate, you can't get folate without taking in a whole um, cornucopia 
of other protective nutrients for the child and vegetables. You're not just getting, it's not isolated folate. When you're taking folic acid as an isolated supplement, look at all the things you're missing that you would have been taking in if you had taken the folate. And, and of course, the studies show that when you eat green vegetables during pregnancy and two years prior to conception, it decreases your child's risk of developing autoimmune conditions, infections, and childhood cancers and brain tumors. So we're creating an epidemic of cancer in children by this idea of giving people folic acid instead of encouraging them to take, eat green vegetables. So here's this, the Cochrane study on um, vitamin A and beta carotene, 68 trials, vitamin A associated with a 16% increased risk of death. Typical amounts used in supplements are associated with hip fractures. Beta carotene supplemental trials, also a higher rate of lung cancer, higher rate of deaths from heart disease. And of course, folic acid supplementation in pregnancy also increases risk of autism. It's absolutely crazy that our health authorities are still recommending folic acid supplementation instead of recommending people eat green vegetables. Now this is an important concept here, the vitamin and mineral biphasic dose response curve. What's clear, and I want you to understand, is an insufficiency of, a, of some nutrient humans require reduce immunity and interfere with lifespan. Of course, if you're severely enough deficient, you can even die from it, but you can't have good health when you're severely deficient. Any nutrients you, humans need having less than optimal is not ideal for your lifespan. Then there's a center region of, that the body uses for homeostasis that's optimal, and then as you take a supplement in excess dosage, almost every supplement, particularly fat-soluble supplements too, that your body can't excrete easily, like vitamin D, you take more and more, it becomes toxic and increased risk of cancer. So I could essentially so, show you a trial that shows for this supplement, and I'm just making up any supplement like vitamin D, that the high levels are dangerous, that you shouldn't be taking vitamin D because you take too much, this could happen, like breast cancer could increase. But that doesn't mean you should be vitamin D deficient. Just because too much of something causes a problem doesn't mean you should not take anything and allow yourself to be deficient. In other words, don't drive your level. Don't think if a little bit of something is good, then a lot is better and take high doses of anything. So the facts that there are studies showing, like, like I, in my book, The End of Heart Disease, I describe that high doses of fish oil increase the risk of atrial fibrillation. But I also show studies that show that Deficiencies of omega-3 fatty acids increase risk of atrial fibrillation as well. That both too much and too little can cause the problem. So you want to hit that sweet spot in the center, and we're going to describe what that means and how that works, okay? So nutrients matter. A deficiency of almost any nutrient promotes more rapid aging. Here's a good example. We're using zinc because zinc is something that we were able to absorb less as we get older. And the chance for zinc insufficiency with aging increases, therefore increasing risk of causes of death from cancer and pneumonia and infection due to lower immune function. So here's a study showing 15 milligrams of zinc a day is sort of a 74% risk of death from prostate cancer, and of course half the mortality from pneumonia when you give elderly people zinc up a low-dose zinc supplement. Zinc and cancer. Zinc is present in plant foods, but it's higher amounts in animal products. It's not that it's not present in your diet, it's that plant foods have a lot of phytates that bind zinc, so zinc is poorly absorbed from beans and nuts and vegetables. It's more easily absorbed from animal products. So therefore, it's one of the nutrients that we give a little bit extra on a plant-based diet, not a lot extra, just a little bit extra to assure that optimal amount to make up for what you're not absorbing compared to a person that ate a little bit of animal products. We can go over the fact, that, you know, why not just eat a little bit of animal products then? Why not just have a little bit of clams or oysters or sardines or, or whatever, you, you know, or salamanders or snakes or turtles or wildy beasts? That was a joke. Wildy beast was a joke. That part you should have giggled on at least a little bit. Not even the turtles and the snakes, but the, okay, the salamanders. But those, actually, when you think about it, salamanders, frogs, turtles, snakes, those were natural foods for humans in our, his, in our genetic history. People ate little, you know, ate grasshoppers and worms and salamanders, and that's what they ate. For their, they weren't killing, they weren't running down and killing the woolly mammoths and the rhinoceroses that much. 
The point is, why not eat, why not eat a little bit of these foods? And the, the, the reason is that a little bit doesn't give you enough. A little bit of the food doesn't really optimize your vitamin B12. Isn't it? So you need a, a more substantial amount of animal products to get enough of these nutrients we need. And when you eat a more substantial amount, then you don't just increase risk of cancer from the mechanisms we discussed, you also expose yourself to a higher degree of toxic pollutants and plastics. Because we dump so much plastic in the ocean that the smaller fish and the clams and the oysters and the sardines that used to be cleaner, where toxic metals accumulated in larger predatory fish, are no longer the case. Now we have more toxic, toxic plastics off, dumped off the continental shelf, and even smaller fish and lower, and lower seafood on the food chain that are not predatory still are heavily contaminated. And if you're going to try to get your zinc and your um, omega-3 fatty acids from those type of foods, you're still going to get too much plastic exposure, microplastic and other pollutants, PCBs. And even they measure even the PCBs in polar bears in the Arctic, and we've spread the pollutants all over the world. So we're trying to eat lower on the food chain. So, even though, so a little bit of animal products probably is not going to do it for you. And, the, and trying to get enough, enough of these zinc or DHA through animal foods is not recommended. And in the data we have available, it seems to be most likely that a vegan diet that's intelligently and conservatively supplemented is more lifespan promoting than a person who's trying to eat more plant heavy and use animal products to get extra nutrients from in a smaller amounts. And the other issue is, is that when people start having animal products in their diet, it wants them to have more and more of that. They can't control it and keep it low, especially if they're overweight or a food addict. It tries to derail them. It's cleaner to just stay on the path and keep your boundaries kind of neat. You know, it doesn't mean a person can't have a little bit of animal product once in a while is going to kill them. But we overall don't want to eat so much that we're going to get all our nutrients that way. You follow me? So zinc deficiency frequently seen in the elderly, current investigations, that zinc deficiency in increases risk of neurodegenerative disorders, including Alzheimer's, depression, and Parkinson's disease. So there definitely is an advantage to taking a little zinc. And I'm just bringing zinc up first because it makes a good example where a little bit can help people significantly, just a little bit extra, but a lot isn't the answer. You don't say, oh, zinc helps COVID, so we should be taking 50 milligrams of zinc three times a day. No, you're, just, you're getting a good amount of zinc in your diet. You're just not absorbing it well. Just take a little bit extra, like 10 or 15. You don't need that much. You just want to hit that sweet spot. Multivitamins and longevity, the studies are mixed. And the reason their studies are mixed is because there's some beneficial parts of multivitamins. For example, vitamin K for a person not eating green vegetables or iodine, who's not using salt, who doesn't get enough iodine, not using iodinated salt, or getting extra vitamin D when they're not getting, spending their life out in the sun. Or, so there's some advantages to taking supplements, B12, but, but the problem is they contain, most of them contain dangerous things mixed in. So you have a mixed bag. Multivitamins without vitamin A and folic acid may have the potential to enhance lifespan because there's been some studies show that telomere shortening decreases the rate of telomere shortening and you're able to age slower when you're taking these multivitamins. But that's just because these people's diets are not adequate. So they're supplying some things to fill in the gaps of the inadequacies in their diet, which may then offset the things they're taking that they didn't need to take. It's better to target what you're taking and not take things that are extra or too much extra that you don't need. So my supplemental recommendations for vegans are people eating relatively healthfully. So I actually advocate a certain style of eating that I feel is so critically valuable for those people who want to know what's very best. Right? I'm not watering down my recommendations to be most popular or what people will accept or want to do. Or I'm just focusing on what's best for people to not to sell people out who want the best information. To give people the gold standard of nutritional excellence. And then say, okay, we're eating the best diet we can. Then could we make this any better? And what are the drawbacks of the diet that's so well designed to be so longevity promoting. And to just give you a little bit of my background, a pers my personal story and how I developed this, is that in my teenage years, 
My father was overweight and sickly and had a lot of medical problems. I spent a lot of time in the car driving him from doctor to doctor. And he, could, he was, had to lie in the back seat of the station wagon on a mattress with the, with the back seats folded flat. So he couldn't sit up because his back was in so much pain. You know, but in any case, you know, to chiropractors and osteopaths and, and doctors, anyway, but the point is, my father first read Jack Duntrop's book, You Don't Have to Be Sick, written in the 1950s, and we started to read all of Dr. Shelton's works, and we read the, I used to go to the natural hygiene conventions when I was young, and we started to get the family eating healthfully, and it made my father a lot better. He lost weight, he got in better health, he, he got more flexible, his back pains improved, and and I started to get into health and nutrition. And I would go to a conference and I'd be sitting in the audience like you, listening to some guy on the stage, you know, like, like Alec Burton, Kikbi Sidwa, Vitrano, you know, these guys. And so I learned a lot and I thought that they had, it was good information in influencing my, my um, desire and have actually had the effect to get me passionate about this information, wanting to go to medical school and per to pursue a career in, in um, being a physician specializing in nutrition. But the problem was, I got involved with, this, with that movement when I was relatively young, and I was able to witness the people who were my mentors and people who motivated and excited me to see what happened to their health as they aged, and whether they lived a long time or got medical conditions, whether they were healthy or not. And to my dismay and, and concern, even as a young physician, a lot of these people I was caring for who used to were the older members of the society, of the American Natural Hygiene Society, the American Vegan Society, of people who, and a lot of um, vegan and plant-based eaters who used me as their primary care doctor as I was a medical doctor and they had developing problems. They, people would fly in from all over the country to see me because they respected my, my judgment and my connection with the community, with the plant-based community. I wouldn't um, steer them wrong. And what I found was a lot of people were developing um, neurological problems and Parkinson's disease and dementia. So we'd have a lot of healthy people living a long time, not dying of cancer, not having a heart disease, but losing their memory and developing mental disorders and dementia. And many of them developed Parkinson's, including many of the people who were my mentors and people who were, used to lecture to, the, to us in the audience. Dr. Sidwa got Parkinson's disease. Dr. Um, Shelton got Parkinson's disease. There was three other people that got Parkinson's disease. Some names I can't mention. But in any case, the point is, is that when I did my evaluation of these people and took their blood tests and looked at their health and see what they could have been missing, the major factor was that their omega-3 index and the level of DHA in their tissues were exceedingly low, even sometimes super low, like zero. And so the question is, could a deficiency of omega-3 fatty acids that are easily achieved from seafood, like fish, could that accelerate the susceptibility to the toxins and poisons that cause Parkinson's disease? And could low levels of oh, those omega-3, even in spite of you eating a diet that's healthy and full of the, and these people weren't eating a vegan diet or a plant-based diet, they were eating a diet that was all full of natural organic foods and fruits and vegetables and salads. They were eating, a, the natural hygiene movement wasn't eating, a, wasn't junk food vegans. They were eating super healthy food. But they were still developing all these problems even dying of those problems. So my research and investigation obviously showed there was a tremendous amount of information, solid information, to document that low levels of omega-3 fatty acids create inflammation in the brain, predisposes the brain to damage from toxins in the environment that wouldn't bother a person who had adequate levels. And even though we have learning that Parkinson's is caused by environmental toxicity, the susceptibility to that environmental toxicity and chemicals is enhanced by DHA deficiency. But definitely there's a plethora of studies, which we're going to go into right now, showing low levels of DHA in the bloodstream and the blood cells, encouraging brain atrophy or brain shrinkage as well as cognitive impairment. And I've even had people who come to me in my practice who were B12 deficient. And so many people in the plant-based community are saying, ah, take a little B12, it doesn't need it, you don't need it that much, or it's overblown. I've had so much experience taking care of thousands of patients in this community, and I've seen people who were paralyzed, and who, people who couldn't walk, and who couldn't have their balance, and you know, or people who have permanent damage due to B12 deficiency. I've seen enough of this, enough damage from plant-based eating, but that's not supplemented appropriately to be more cautious and conservative in this, in this field.